Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this our fourth season, we're looking at Kenneth Branagh's 2011 film, Thor. I'm Matthew Fox from TheEthicalPanda.com. And I'm Andy Nelson from The Next Real Film Podcast. And today we're talking about Minute 36, which begins with an empty bed at the hospital and ends with a good old-fashioned hammer party. Andy, how do you think you would do if you ever had to try to to, to pull up Mjolnir? Do you think you'd be worthy? <laughs> well, you know, uh, at, at Disneyland, they have, uh, you know, because, you know, Disney did the Sword in the Stone movie. And so there is actually a sword in the stone at uh, the Magic Kingdom. And I've tried pulling that up. And I was never the lucky kid who got to actually pull it out. <laughs> and so I have a feeling just based on that alone that I would just be as bad as all of these people. But I'd probably love watching and <laughs> seeing people, you know, try being idiots to get this thing out of the ground. We will talk about a few of those idiots and the music that's playing while they make their attempt, as well as an empty hospital bed right after this message. Want to jump into the conversation with us about Thor and the minutes we're discussing this week? We have a growing group of Marvel fans just waiting to chat with you over in our Discord server. Head to truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute and click on the Discord link. Welcome back. So we open in this great shot of the the empty bed and then getting into the van. And we once again have these Dutch angles. We keep talking about them, but I have to say, I didn't know the term at all. This was the scene where I first really noticed them because the first time I watched the movie, because, you know, you just caught up in so many other things. I'm not a very visual person. But here it's just so striking for them that, you know, everything in their world is off kilter. It's off balance. This this man has fallen from the heavens. It doesn't make any sense. And not only that, but now he's gone. Right, exactly. And it's it's a great shot, too, because, you know, we're we're I mean, we saw the beginning of this shot in the last minute. Uh, last week but here it's it's a it's a boom shot and it's coming up over the top of the bed and it gives us that god's eye view over thor's bed which again is such a great technique that brana is using constantly in this movie to kind of give us that god's eye view sometimes it's called a bird's eye view but whatever it makes so much more sense in this film to just call it god's eye view because you're looking straight down <laughs> on everything and this is Heim- what heimdall would say <laughs> exactly this is heimdall's view which you know you think about that that is kind of odd that what he's constantly seeing is like the tops of everybody's heads <laughs> <laughs> no that's a good point and so we, we get with each of the characters i think a great um you know, between Jane, Eric, and Darcy, the way they react as they start talking about this, I think just says so much about each of them. And, and let's kind of just start with Jane because, you know, she's not concerned for the person. She, she literally says, you know, I just lost my most important piece of evidence. And I, I kind of like that this is where they're going with her. We've talked about it before, but it's again sort of showing she's not the, oh, she's the woman, so she's super compassionate. Like, she doesn't want to get him killed, probably because that means a lot of paperwork for her to fill out. But also, you know, killing people's bad. But <laughs> mostly she's there for the science. And it's only when he becomes scientifically relevant that she started caring about him. And now she's sad he's gone because, again, science. He's the only one who can tell her what it was like inside that event. And that, again, just speaks to the scientific nature of things. It's about the evidence. It's about the the event. Like, it's all such uh, kind of that closed off point of view, that perspective that she has. And I really like that. I like that they give that to her consistently throughout this film. It, it just, I don't know, it speaks to kind of that place where her head is. Well, and I think it's also interesting because, again, I'm projecting all over the place all throughout this whole podcast. But one of the things that I kind of get out of it is, you know, we had and we'll get a lot more of Thor and Loki and the Asgardians. They see the people on Midgard kind of like pets, you know, like they're <laughs> they're good people to, you know, to protect and to show off when you want to have some be it free beer and pretty maidens throw themselves at you and stuff like that, but they're not, you know, on their level. And, you know, for them, it's more of a kind of like patronizing thing. And in some ways though, Jane has a similar thing in that for her, she has this, like, he's not a person, he's a specimen, you know? And I think it's just kind of a fun thing of we've seen Thor treat the people, treat his lessers quite literally as though they're that. And that's kind of what Jane's doing here, which is kind of a fun dichotomy. Well, and I, okay. So, but I, I think this is interesting because 
there's a there's an interesting perspective also about a person that you find wandering in the desert who seems to be drunk or on something um and then and then a person who has has all of that but also is attractive right and i think like there's a there's an element of them that i think continuously says this is this is a crazy man we met in the desert. Like if this looked like an old bearded man who had a beard down to his knees, who had been wandering the desert saying the same things, they would likely, you know, want to keep their distance. But Jane's reaction would probably be exactly the same, right? The fact that this is evidence. I want to know what it was like inside that event. And I think that this is going to that's an interesting thing to talk about this week for sure as as you know as some of that kind of changes and the idea of evidence versus kind of this this person who actually was did come down i think that there's an right. interesting perspective there yeah i think that's a really good point and i think it can somewhat speak to jane being fairly conflicted in this moment and and you know on one hand she has hit this man with her car as we find out in just a few moments twice she's also at least once noticed that he is a rather good looking uh specimen uh and and I can see there on being a like like I think she is genuinely just science first, but I also think this might be a situation where focusing on the science allows her to both not think about like damn he's a good looking man, but even more so, um like I hit this man with my car and he possibly just came down from space and like you know it, it's that kind of like when everything else is falling apart around you you stick to what you know and what she knows yeah. is scientific analysis. Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting because like, I mean, I, I it's interesting because I think that there's the way that they played that scene where Thor and Jane look at each other after he kind of wakes up on the ground and they have that rather long moment where the two of them stare into each other's eyes. I think there's an element of the way that I read it. It's, it's very much that rom-com moment that we're talking about. There's an element where they're like, wow, that person's hot. Like they're both saying that, I'm sure, because they're both gorgeous people. But on the other end of that, I think that they're designing it to say like they're looking into each other's souls and they feel a connection. And so that's that whole thing. Yeah. This is the meat cute to exactly. use the, the right. rom-com vocabulary for sure. Right, right. So let's talk about Eric, because Eric is I, I think he's stayed kind of true to this. He seems like the person who has the best idea of the big picture of this, because Again, he's not as interested in the science. He, you know, he is a scientist, but he seems to understand some perspective. But also now he's now shifted. I think he was the only one who really recognized, like, you see him noticing, like, the broken glass and the, the damage and things like that. Yeah. And, and he says, I'm not sure finding him is the best idea. Yeah. Did you see what he did in there? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, he is a, a built like a tank and destroyed that hospital room. And, and Jane is like, let's let's go get him. Let's go get him. And I think Eric is kind of being very smart here. Now, it's it's interesting, though, because he also is a scientist, as we know. I mean, she brought him here just to look at these astronomical, uh, you know, occurrences and, and wants to kind of have this conversation with him and, and, and show him what she's discovered because they're both science minded people. But I think there's an element to him that that has the wisdom. And I mean, he's older, uh, the whole uh, the adage older and wiser. Right. I mean, he's kind of like playing that very much here where he's looking at it a little more seriously here. And I think that there's there's something to that. Yeah, I think the older, the wiser and jaded is the word that comes to mind. You know, he strikes me as the person who. He's watching Jane on her first big kind of like she designed this research project and she's seeing something and she's super excited and he wants to help her. He's there for her. But he's probably had four or five times where he got super excited about something and it turned out it was actually a lot more mundane than he thought. You know, he and he I think he's just trying to be the reality check. And I think it's, it's in part a genuine affection he has. You know, this is his student. This is someone who he probably feels not like mentor, you know, this, he's like senpai and our mentor. He's not like a parental figure, but still some like, you know, he wa she's under his wing. Um, well, and let's also remember, like, he's the one who's from the place where they talked about Thor. You know, he hasn't said it yet, but he's going to soon this week. He'll start talking about this idea that, you know, he's talking about Heimdall. He's talking about Bifrost. He's like, there are words that are coming out. His name is Thor. There are words coming out of his mouth that are, you know, that I have heard all my life growing up. 
and like and I think he's in this place where he's really I I don't know if he is, has any sense that some of this could actually be true and he's trying to shut it off and pretend like I can't I can't go down that road because then that means like all those storybook of uh, fairy tales were actually real or if he's really just like this guy clearly read the same books I did and is just he's just yeah. crazy I think especially from, and again, I don't want to project backwards too much, but in later movies, even when he's under Loki's sway, he, it's very clear that he loves science for the purpose of science, you know, and that it always seemed like part of why Loki is able to, to turn him so quickly is because he's that like, all right, you know, he, right now he thinks about the morality, but Loki can wait that part out because he's just fascinated by everything. And I think he's, my sense of him is that he's the sort of person who is kind of open, like, you know, a lot of people would be like, okay, well, clearly the idea that the myths are based in truth is just not a possibility. So we have to leave that out. He seems the Sherlock Holmes, you know, the, well, when you've ruled out the impossible, the improbable becomes the likely answer. And I don't think he's jumping to this must be an Asgardian yet, but I think he's, it strikes me. He's very, he's trying very hard to say, I'm curious about what's happening. I want to understand what's happening, but also I want to keep everybody alive while we're doing that. And let's kind of catch our breath, get safe and get focused. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. So so let's jump to Darcy, because Darcy <laughs> also seems to have a fairly, um, you know, on brand reaction here in that, you know, Jane is saying this. Eric is saying, well, you know, we're not sure finding the right idea. Jane says, no, we're going to find him. And Darcy's like, OK. And she just pulls out her taser and it's just kind of like, you know, it's like the polishing the gun scene of like, we're going hunting. Such a Darcy um, moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very funny. So this, so this time we actually get a pretty good view of her taser and it turns out this is an X-26 taser. And what's interesting about this is if you listen when she picks it up and like pulls it out of her bag, it sounds like she cocks it like a pistol, like she'd like, chick -chick you know, which you can't do with a taser. So it's it's clearly like the sound effects team, like just they said, if we put these in, it just sounds like, you know, you're doing some business with it uh, because otherwise you don't you don't do any of that. So it's it's a very weird sound effect to have included with it. You know, this is where we get into comic book logic, where yeah. the fact of an Asgardian coming down to Earth through a Bifrost, we can believe that. But a taser being <laughs> cocked is just a bridge too far. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I want to get into, though, what becomes one of my biggest nightmares this movie, because um, ever since I started driving, I didn't grow up driving. I grew up in New York City. I didn't learn to drive until I was 25 or so. And one of my biggest nightmares is always pulling out of one of those crazy, like, mall target uh, parking lots, and someone just wanders right by in front of my car, and I hit it. And so, <laughs> like, do you think it's Jane's fault? Is it Thor's fault? Is it a little bit of everything? Like... <sighs> Uh, well, OK, so, I mean, Jane is in a tizzy, I guess we could say she's she's very much like she doesn't have her head on straight. She's she's very much, you know, kind of panicked about now having to go around New Mexico and, and find this guy, as as Eric says. And so when she, I mean, she does look back. So I, I can't I can't fault her too much. Now, the one thing that she obviously doesn't do is she doesn't look, you know, you have not just the rear window but you also have passenger windows that you could also see and you mm -hmm. can't like i can clearly see thor walk past and so she yeah. should have been able to see thor walking past those passenger windows before she actually hit him but also i mean I, I don't know i can't fault thor because it's not his world and he's been dazed he's been drugged you know there's a lot of potential things that are that are kind of causing him to be foggy um, but that being said, he also is fairly smart and knows how to pay attention to things. I mean, we've seen him accomplish quite a bit so far in the film. Right. Yeah, I, I think I kind of agree with that. Like, I had forgotten, but when I was watching it in this kind of, you know, shot by shot way that we do here, that you get a good, like, half to three quarters of a second of Thor kind of walking behind. And, yeah, I feel like I would be a little more sympathetic to Jane if we'd heard, like, a squelch of the, you know, her slamming on the brakes or something like that. Clearly, it's not, you know, she hit him at maybe like five miles an hour. She's not going super fast. Uh, please, no listeners, take that as a reason to uh, not be careful as you're pulling out of uh, garages and then sue us. 
be very careful. Look both <laughs> ways. Seatbelt on. Wear your mask. Black Lives Matter. All the good stuff. I tell um, you, the, this is this is why I like my rear view camera. <laughs> yeah, for this very reason. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. Um, so okay, so and, and yeah, I think the, you got to the other part I wanted to bring up here, which is that this is one more way he's a fish out of water, and I, yes, I think it's in kind of yes. in two things. One is just that he's not used to cars. But also, I think we've kind of established he's not used to the idea that mundane things can actually hurt him. You know, I think he's sort of yeah, used true. to the thinking of, well, sure, if the car bounces into me, it's going to break its fender, but I'm a god. I'm not going to notice it. Well, that's a good question. Like, what would have happened if if he did have his strength? Like, would it have been like she had run into a pole? It, like, it, and it would have actually, like, stopped her car? Or would it, like, have pushed him back a little bit? Like how much, because I feel, I mean, obviously it's a lot of mass and it's still going to kind of hit him and do something, I would think. But uh, yeah, it does make you wonder. Yeah. I do love Jane's line. I swear I'm not doing this on purpose. It's such Um, a great line. (laughs) Yeah, such a great line. What's interesting is that in the script, there's actually a little more here about uh, kind of all of this stuff that happens here out in the out in the parking lot. And. Uh, I mean, it's not a lot, but what I like about it is after she says that line, Thor looks up at the sky and this is the moment where he realizes where he is. He says, blue sky, one sun. This is Earth, isn't it? And then Darcy says, I think you may have hit him with the car one, two, one, you know, one time too many. And then she says, let's get you some clothes. And so it's I mean, what I like about it is just he realizes where he is finally. But it's it's is, not is that the necessary. Script? Yeah, that's in the script. Okay, yeah, I was like, that didn't make it into the, the thing. But yeah, it, it, it's a good moment to sort of recognize. Yeah, yeah. So, also, so, just just as another scripted moment that I just want to bring up real quick, when they arrive at the hospital, they actually have to go back and face the admissions nurse again. And uh, it's actually kind of a funny scene. And I wish that they would have put it in because, if anything, it actually makes me like Dawn, our admissions nurse, that much more. It's kind of funny because she says, I'm sorry, only relatives can visit the patients. And then Jane says, I'm his wife. And the admissions nurse <laughs> says, I, I thought you said you didn't know him. And Jane is like, I mean, I, I barely know him anymore. The man he's become, he's changed. I mean, <laughs> what woman really knows her husband anyway? And then the admissions nurse is like, none of us, dear. He's in room so-and-so and tells him they're in room so It's like, that would have made me, like, I liked that. Like, that would have been yeah. so much better to have than T-H. Like, try, like, the spelling thing with her, I just don't care mm-hmm. for it all. Yeah, it's, I think that would have been fun. I don't feel like that would feel in character for Jane, for her to be that, like, quick on her feet with the improv stuff. But, <laughs> probably you know, true. That's it would have been a fun true. scene. Yeah. So so now we switch uh, switch to a different part of New Mexico where we're back to the hammer and we're having a hammer party. We have a whole <laughs> bunch of people kind of gathered around. It's a festive atmosphere. People are grilling hot dogs uh, and kind of clacking along with their, uh, the, their, their grill tongs. And... The song that's playing, I looked it up. It's called "I Can Help" by Billy Swan. It was uh, Billy Swan's biggest hit from is from 1974. It actually topped the Billboard charts, uh, which might tell you a good deal about 1970s music. Um, although I'm a fan of the song, <laughs> hey, and no. another really is. I, I love 70s um, music. This, this, yeah. but this, I mean, it's very much country. I mean, it was a number one country song too, right. and I think it stayed on the country charts a lot longer than it did on the Billboard charts. But yeah, yeah. Uh, and he actually went on to have kind of a success, pretty successful career, a little bit as a uh, songwriter, well, a little bit as a singer, but mostly as a songwriter. And he wound up writing songs for a lot of really big country stars like Conway Twitty, Waylon Jennings, and Mel Tillis. Um, and the last little factoid I learned about him, not relevant in any way, but kind of wonderful, is that he uh, has two daughters named Planet and Sierra. Planet Swan. Planet Swan and Sierra Swan. Sierra Swan. I guarantee you they're both like lawyers or investment bankers or something like that. <laughs> they, but they both have superhero names. That's the best part. It's like both right? of them should be superheroes. I love it. Planet Swan and Sierra Swan. That's awesome. I, I had friends when I was in my 20s who were children of huge hippie parents, and they were named Arwen and Merlin. And they literally, <laughs> like, one of them was an investment banker, and the other was in advertising. They were both oh, just wow. like, you know, super <laughs> mundane. <laughs> totally, went, lives. totally went opposite, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So let's talk about who's at this kind of party atmosphere oh, together wow. because yeah. it's um it seems like it's mostly guys. Uh, there's a couple of women involved, but they're not really we don't really see women at all involved in the pulling. There's one shot where I again did like the Zapruder thing 
where when one person is pulling and you've got a couple people behind him as though they're getting ready to pull and you see like a flash of long blonde hair that could be a woman, but like, you don't know, but it's mostly seems to be guys who are here because it's, it's fun, but it's also a test of strength, you know, and they're kind of trying to out macho each other and show that one of them is going to be able to figure this out. They are very much uh, all trying to just like, I mean, it turns into this whole machismo thing of like, who's going to be the one who gets it out and it's free. And, you know, people love opportunities to do stuff like this, especially when it's free. <laughs> so they all get to come out to this crater, have a party, try to rank, uh, rip this thing out of the ground and, uh, you know, and have some hot dogs. What I, so I was, I was curious too. I was going through the shots trying to figure out like how many people came out here just in the first shot, I think I counted at least 30 townies. Any, anyone who's credited in the scene is a townie. So I'm just calling them all townies. So we've got at least 30 townies, at least 11 vehicles, and one bicycle. That means one person decided, <laughs> I'm going to bike out there. We know, well, we'll find out later, this is 50 miles west of town. That is a heck of a long bike ride. Now, it's it looks like it's cold uh, New Mexico right now. It's kind of a wintry sort of, I mean, it, although this is June 1st, as we know, so everyone's in coats. Yeah. So it makes no sense. Thanks. Uh, you know, the Marvel timeline doesn't take into account what uh, what weather they actually had to film in. So the fact that everyone's in coats doesn't quite line up with June 1st. But hey, I watch this movie as someone who's now living in Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, which are apparently one of the most outdoorsy towns. And the number of people I know who go on 100 mile bike rides just because it's Tuesday is quite high. I don't <laughs> understand it, but you know, hey, 50 miles for some free education. I, I do also funny. love that we get a quite literal hold my beer guy. You know, he in this case, it seems he he wants to finish the beer instead of asking someone else to hold it. But it's that same energy of like, I'm going to do this, but let me just you got to take my beer out of my hand. I'm going to do this, uh, which I thought was a great little detail. So and I, I want to go through some of these people because some of them are credited and actually have some have some more information. Some of them don't. And I'm very disappointed because they've they've named. Usually it's the people who end up getting lines. Those are the ones that officially gets get credits. Uh, you know, we've got the crowd of people. Then we cut to, you know, someone getting ready to pull and you see him pulling hard. And then you cut to I'm going to name him Grilling Townie because he's the one who's grilling. Now, he's my hero. You know, what, this <laughs> is fun. We're going to have some food. Like what? A, what I love about him, okay, and this is this is what I don't understand, because it looks like, as we kind of cut to the grill, it looks like he has basically set a pop-up tent in the in, in the bottom of the impact crater. Like, you, he's got a big wall next to him, and uh, he's got a pop-up tent, he's got his cooler hanging from it, he's grilling hot dogs, he is like, he's got the table set up, he is ready. But what's interesting is we'll never, ever see him again. Like, there's no shot where we see a pop-up tent anywhere and so i'm really curious like where are we not seeing in all these shots because clearly <laughs> there's a pop-up tent somewhere right for me i just have this image that's the guy who you know he spends his sundays making a couple extra bucks by taking this the, you know grilling hot dogs for the vfws and the boy <laughs> scout groups and all that and so he just had his truck ready and so someone says <laughs> right. like hey and you know he's probably charging them 15 bucks a dog because where else are you gonna get food and, you know Absolutely. god bless him <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So next up, we actually cut to what's great. It's a it's a fantastic shot. I'm going to call it the Mjolnir cam because we're basically like on the rock with Mjolnir looking up at, at one of the townies who's really trying hard to pull. This is Pete, Pete the townie. He is one of the few who's credited and we'll find out later why. Uh, Pete is played by Matt Battaglia um, and he is... One of these people who is in all sorts of stuff. He is a very, very busy actor. Um, but a lot of these kind of smaller parts, if you look at his IMDb top four, it's actually this movie, Thor, as Pete. The next one is Best Worst Weekend Ever, where he plays Colonel Cliff Andropolis. Then it's Brothers, the uh, the movie that he that was um, with Jake Gyllenhaal. And I think it was Tobey Maguire in that, was it? I can't I quite so. remember, but um, he actually was a co-producer on that film, which is, uh, oh, okay. I thought, very exciting. And actually, Natalie Portman um, nice. was uh, was also in that. So there's a connection there. And last but not least, it's last shot with Judge uh, Gunn, where he also produced that. It looked like a, mm. a little uh, TV project that he did. I, I shouldn't say little. 216 episodes of that. Nice. Uh, but over two years. So I don't know if it's like a web series or what, because that's a lot of episodes to crank out over two years. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, but he's got a great face and he's very much trying hard. <laughs> I do need to also point out, uh, I, I had to leave 
for last week's episodes where we saw this, the first person to try and uh, pull pull the hammer. And I know you all talked about him, but I got to just say a quick word that uh, the, the JMS, the writer, John Michael Straczynski, who is just such a huge hero of mine, uh, particularly my, my spouse and I literally last night just finished our rewatch of all of Babylon 5, which oh, wow. I haven't figured out how to get back on, how to get a podcast about it onto either Stranded Panda or the next real podcast, but I'm going to do it because it's just <laughs> one of the greatest TV shows out there. He also wrote Sense8. He was uh, one of the original writers of Shira, and he was one of the people who was most like supportive of the new one and like yelling at people who were mad that the new Shira wouldn't you know be TNA all the time. So he's just... Awesome guy. I love that he's involved in this project. I love that he got to be on screen. So when you say original writer of She-Ra, you mean the original one, like back in the He-Man Masters of the Universe days. Yeah, I don't think that he was the original writer, but he was he was a writer for the original, yeah, oh, the original 70s, show. 80s version of Okay, um, that's the one that I, I grew up on, that and He-Man, and their crossover episodes. Like, I loved all that. That's great. Yeah, well, okay, cool. Fun. Very cool. Not a big fan of the new He-Man, but did love the new She-Ra. I, I didn't even know they did a new He-Man. That's how out of touch I am <laughs> with all of that. Well, at least you know we get JMS, not in this minute, but he will. Um, uh, no, we will see him again in this minute and, and the next one. So he's he's around. He's still watching. There you go. Now, you mentioned the drunk one already. That's Drunk Townie. That's how he's okay. credited as Drunk Townie. Uh, um, that's fine. He will but, always be hold my beer guy. In my well, mind. exactly. But we do find out later. Or actually, no, I take it back. We find out in the script his name is Jake. It's, he's never oh, called out okay. as Jake, but it is Jake. This is Joel McCrary, and he and Pete will have a scene later. That's why they are both named here. But uh, but so we do have Jake who comes up with his beer, tries to finish it before he takes uh, takes a whack at it. And of course, uh, we uh, obviously doesn't do it. But yeah, so because as you were saying, now we cut to this next moment here. Right. So some engineering ideas where we're thinking, okay, well, if human force power can't do it, because I think. At this point, they're not thinking this is supernatural. They're just thinking this is wedged into the rock somehow, and they just need to generate enough force. At least that's what I'm gathering. And so they wrap a chain around the handle and figure, okay, well, this white pickup truck, which um, we don't see who's driving it yet, but we will, and we'll get to that in the next minute. Yes. But it seems yes, at this point, will. like, that seems like a pretty sensible idea. Yeah, it does. And, and, you know, I had a lot of questions about this. And unfortunately, I couldn't find anybody who had kind of put the math together because I really wanted to know. It's like, OK, so, I mean, it, they're they're tying the chain around not just the hammer, but also around kind of this this stone. I mean, we both know it looks like a cement block that the production department poured for this moment. But we're just assuming it is it is ground that has been melted like it turned into magma from the force of Mjolnir hitting and turned into this giant stone that it is now attached to that's what we're going with so the chain is tied around the hammer and around the stone and they attach it to the uh the trailer hitch in the bed of the pickup how much like how much force is it going to take to actually pull that out like could it actually work would it have been better to tie it to like the trailer hitch of the truck? Like, is there, is there a, like, could it have snapped the rock or like, I just, I'm curious, like what, what scientifically like is ripping, you know, is ripping out of the ground, even something that could have happened here. I mean, I'm wondering why no one's taking a pickaxe to the rock itself. Exactly. You know? like, exactly. If, I, although I, I, I think, and I'm curious if this is also true in the comics, it seems very clear that, as you kind of mentioned before, as a joke about Disney World, about Disney World, they're going for sword in the stone kind of imagery here. Oh, sure, um, absolutely. Is that is that a motif that they use in the comics? I don't know if I can speak to that. I don't. I don't have. I don't know if I've read any comics that that deal with that. So, cool. Well, as always, listeners, if you have some thoughts on that, please let us know. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's about where the the story wraps up uh, for this particular minute. Uh, other than I did want to just say you're right. Your you know, JMS is like right as we get to the the shot of the truck backing up and they're the the chain townies we'll call them are taking the chain down to it. We do see JMS standing on the edge. He's just kind of watching all the stuff that's happening now. So he's still he's still there. Yeah, cool. Good for him. Good for us. All right. Well, Andy, this has been so much fun as always. Um, what what do you do on the for people who maybe just be listening to this, tell us a little bit more about what else you do on the next real uh, pod, family of podcasts. 
Oh, well, I mean, I, you know, aside from the Next Real Film podcast, which, uh, you know, I, I produce and host with uh, my my business partner, Pete Wright, um, that's a show we've been doing. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary here very shortly, uh, believe it or not. So we've talked about uh, a lot of movies on that show. But then we also produce all the other shows and, uh, you know, we do all the editing and uh, get everything posted and out into the world. And so between, you know, all of these shows and then all the other shows that we do for True Story FM, um, yeah, it's just, it's it's a lot of podcasting work that keeps us busy, um, you know, as our, as our, as our work. So, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. It, it's a great collection of, of podcasts. I've gotten to be on a couple of them. I've had a lot of fun with, especially in the film review ones. Um, so, yeah, for folks who, if you're just checking out this podcast, definitely check out some of those. Of course, you can check out my podcast, Superhero Ethics and the Star Wars Universe podcast, just by searching for those names or just by looking for the ethicalpanda.com. So, on behalf of myself, Andy, thank you all so much and have a great day. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is One Last Ride by Martin Puringer. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. 